Okay, now we're we're up. We have uh, doubled in size here at least or more. Um, everyone's here. Hello, everyone. Time. So, as a preface again for what y'all just missed was, um, this was one of our PW Coder funded interns over the summer. Seth, who worked on these websites. Um, so he can't be here because he's in class at school. But he recorded a video of like what he did. So this is his presentation of kind of what he worked on. So we'll hit play. Hi everyone. My name is Seth Blackburn and I'm gonna be talking about some of the work I did during my internship through GW Coders this past summer. Um, my job basically entailed working with faculty member Alexa Jubin to create two sites from scratch, both a personal research website for her and then one for the GW Digital Humanities Institute. And I'm also working with her in the English department this year to work on a de new departmental blog. Um, I'm going to go over a few of the processes we had to go through to accomplish these sites and just some things that are good to know. So for starters, each of the websites we have are hosted on Linode.com and they use WordPress. Um, but before that, what you would most likely want to start with is getting a domain name and a domain name can be purchased from a multitude of websites, but we chose to go with a website called hostinger.com. And each of our domain names is hosted there. So yeah, there are a bunch of different websites you can buy your domain names from. But like I said, we bought ours through Hostinger. Um, no particular reason. This is just the one we went with, but it's important uh, to have a domain name before you try to go in and set up your website because it'll just make things smoother whenever you're uh, setting up your hosting. So as far as hosting goes, uh, we decided to go with Linode, um, Linode.com. Uh, we chose this after getting some advice from Ryan. He's the one who suggested that we use this website. And basically what a, um, Linode or any other hosting service does is they give you some sort of IP address. And this is where you're actually uh, taken to whenever you type in whatever domain you end up buying. Um, in our case, we wanted to add some WordPress sites to our Linode servers. So, but it's actually pretty easy to do. So when you go to your dashboard for Linode and you've already made your account, you would go to create a Linode and you can switch over to the marketplace and they actually have a lot of um, very easy plugins already, some tools for you to use to use for different things, uh, the WordPress is actually right at the top. So you would select this and then scroll down and configure your other settings, you know, your email, your username, the different passwords you're gonna need. And then this is also where you would enter your domain name um, that you purchased for the website that you're gonna be setting up. And yeah, a lot of this is pretty straightforward. Like I said, just usernames and passwords. You can also automatically set up your title, even though this could also obviously be changed later if you needed it to. Um, but yeah, it makes Linode actually makes it very easy on their end to get started uh, setting up your WordPress site. If that's the route you're going down. Um, we also went with the cheapest plan. They have different um, memory plans for you to choose from, but we went the cheapest one that you know served our interest. It's only five dollars a month. And once you've configured all of these things, you know, you can just go over here and create Linode. Obviously, I'm not going to do that right now, but. And then once you've uh, set up your Linode server, you will see them pop up here. As you see, we have um, Alexa's personal website server and then the digital humanities site server. Um, they have in, they have unique IP addresses and we chose this uh, region because it's good to choose the closest location to where you're actually uh, basically from and where people will be accessing your site. New Jersey was the closest to like the DC area. So that's where we went. Another resource and help actually kind of want to point out with this whole Linode and WordPress install is this YouTube video that's actually posted by the official Linode YouTube page. It was really helpful to me uh, when getting everything set up. Uh, and then he talks about the same things I talked about with the one click app, you know, with setting up WordPress and you just type in all the information that you need. Um, so that, those things are already went over, but the more key aspect of this that I would point to the video instead of showing you, because I can't really demonstrate uh, securing a website right now without having an actual one that I need to secure. Both all of the website, websites I've worked on, I've already done. 
But the more important and helpful thing I want to point to in this video is he shows you how to use the terminal to configure okay. Apache and how to secure your website. So I'm sure as many of you know, it's important to keep your website secure and encrypted. And we've done that with each of the ones that I've worked on. So like I said, with a fresh website to use, I can't really show it in this uh, run through, but I will uh, provide the link to Ryan and uh, hopefully he can give it to you. After you set up your Linode, like I said, it's pretty easy. Things will uh, start to populate automatically on Linode's end. And since you use the WordPress app to install it all, it should automatically come together. Um, I can't show you right now, but obviously when it loads in finally, it won't be a full website. It'll just be this very basic blank template. And that's when you'll start building from. Um, this is one of our finished websites. This is Alexa's finished personal research website. And this is what the dashboard of a WordPress website looks like. There's obviously a lot of things going on um, where you handle your posts, your different media, like uh, pictures, videos, documents, and different pages. Some key things to note about WordPress is that you're going to want to choose probably a theme to get you started with. I think whenever we loaded ours in, it, we used, it used this basic 2021 theme. Uh, we ended up going with this theme called Zacro. And uh, it's hard to tell from here what it really looks like, but actually Zacro is kind of like a, a parent theme, an umbrella theme that has multiple themes within it. We went with this kind of like author theme that we adapted to our uses. But uh, even more important thing to note about it is that we ended up actually making a child version of this theme. And the difference between a parent and a child theme is you kind of copy all the data, copy all the files over from the parent and you create a custom child. And the reason this is important to do sometimes is if, you, is if you're really going in and customizing what the theme looks like and how it functions, anytime that parent theme gets updated, there's a potential for it to get like overwritten and you could actually lose your work if you just you know, or trying to change the parent theme. And then you update, you see there's actually an update here that I haven't touched. Um, if you've done work with it, with customizing it, and then you go in to update the parent theme, there's a potential that you could lose that data. So it's actually a good idea to, you know, take a snapshot and take the, the parent theme in that moment and create a child theme. So you have full control over what it looks like, what it does. And so you don't lose any of the work you've done on it. Uh, another key aspect of WordPress is the plugins feature. The plugins make things very easy and really get you going on adding some of the features you would want to your website. Obviously, you're probably not going to be wanting to build literally everything from scratch and using code and everything. That would be a lot to handle. Um, and there's just no point when there's just so many uh, good plugins out there that can get you started on your own. Um, some of the things that we have, you know, is like an analytics plugin, um, a maintenance plugin that, you know, lets you you know, shut down the front of the site so people can't get in while you're actually working on it. An accessibility button, that's very critical. Um, PDF embedder, um, some social icon buttons and a slider that you may have seen on our homepage, you know, that's partly a plugin. Um, a backup and restoration plugin and an ability to send mail and some contact form. Those are all um, achieved through plugins. And then actually the last thing I kind of want to talk about with WordPress is this really big plugin called Elementor that we use pretty much on all of our sites, all the pages is uh, achieved through Elementor. So I'll show you an example here. Um, this is uh, Alexa's research page that shows all of her books, articles, chapters, reviews, awards, and things. Um, but actually, if you go up here and you see edit with Elementor, it takes you to this different look of a page because the default uh, WordPress editor, in my opinion, isn't the most intuitive. Whereas this Elementor plugin gives you a lot more customizability. And I just think it's a lot more intuitive to work with, um, you know, very like drag and drop. And as you can see here, as I, you know, highlight and move over different things, you can see the boxes popping up and showing what they are. These are text editors, uh, image boxes, menus, uh, just various things. And you can obviously customize them any way you want. And it's just much easier, in my opinion, to do it through this plugin versus WordPress's default editor. And then obviously you can add more. Other plugins can actually give you more uh, widgets free to use. That's what these are typically called as widgets. Um, so the last thing I kind of want to go through is if you have multiple domain names and you find it necessary to use multiple domain names to point to the same website 
or if you already have another domain name that you kind of want to point to a new website that you're making or some example like that. We had to do that in our case because Alexa wanted to have multiple URL endings that uh, all pointed to her same research website, ajubin.org. So she purchased ajubin.net and she wanted to make sure that if people tried to navigate to ajubin.net, that it would also point to the right website. So we used a website and a tool called cloudfair.com. And basically, you know, you make an account and you log into your dashboard and you go in and you add a website. Um, once again, it's hard to go through an example right now because I don't have a new URL that I need to add. But once you've added it, this is what you would do, this is what you would do, and this is what you would find. Um, the part that you're going to want to find is under rules, and there are page rules that you can set up, and you would add it. And basically, all you have to do is tell it that you know if you go to ajuvin.net, make it a forwarding URL that goes to a permanent redirect and you just tell it the website that you want it to go to and then you would click save. That's about all I wanted to cover. We talked about getting things set up on Linode and uh, purchasing domain names on something like hostinger.com. Uh, we talked about WordPress and its different features, um, you know, picking a theme, choosing different plugins, and there's, you know, all kinds of different things, uh, using Elementor to customize your actual pages. Um, this YouTube resource video, which is very helpful for uh, securing the website. And yeah, that's about it. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, it's unfortunate that Seth couldn't be with us today to kind of talk us through some of that and answer some questions. Um, but I did post the link to the video that he suggested um, and I see that Alexa has also posted links to each of the websites that he's been building. Um, so I'll turn it over to Alexa in just a moment um, to talk more about kind of where they started with this project. And then I can jump in and John can help fill in and talk kind of how this related to what we're doing with GW coders. And um, I've also developed many websites using WordPress, and so I'm happy to answer if people have questions about those. I also use Linode, so I can ask questions, um, and Cloudflare. So I use all those same tools that he does. They're pretty common tools. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Alexa, to talk some about like the inspiration behind the project, um, how it went with working with them, and what you learned as well through this process. Here I am. Thank you, John. Someone want to move that mug that John just placed in front of the camera in the room. <laughs> you hi everyone live in the room. This is Alexa <laughs> from the department. And um, I'm really grateful to the GW Coders program. I think it's a mutual learning experience. As you know, I'm a humanities faculty. I'm pretty new to this. Um, with a lot of help, especially from Ryan this summer, I was able to get a head start along with Seth. Seth um, has more foundation than I have in coding, but a lot of this is new to him as well. So we learned together. Um, I dreamed up various features. For example, I needed to upload a lot of PDFs, my publications in PDF format. But then I need a table of contents page showing all of these. And ideally, there should be a thumbnail to, to each item, each bibliographic item. And I wanted a feature to automatically generate to, for the system to capture the first page of the PDF, usually a book cover or journal cover, and put it there. Um, and so Seth did a lot of digging, and he figured out how to semi-automate the process with a plugin. And this kind of innovation, it, it kind of, in the beginning, we did, we spent a lot of time planning the overall structure of the site. But then as you go, you will discover you need small things here and there. For example, when you share a particular page from website on social media, I, I, I would like, I would like the feature image to show, right? Rather than, rather than just text. Imagine if you share something on Instagram or, or, or Facebook usually um, it automatically, if the website is designed right, automatically an image would, would show up. And I wanted that feature again, that requires a plugin. Um, 
And along the way, Seth taught me just enough, like what he just went through, the note and everything, maintenance, you know, the back end maintenance. Now I know enough about basic HTML as well as the interface to do all the updates myself going forward after Seth um, leaves the program. And I think that's really invaluable. It's not just about having a system to build something that you dream up, but rather have a deeper understanding of how best to organize a lot of information, a lot of data on a website. And I, I find that a very important topic today. It's about knowledge organization and presentation, right? How do you present? How do you make the whole thing flow and be intuitive? Think, think about it from the perspective of a visitor. Um, and, and so we revised our designs along the way um, in those areas as well. So beyond the technicality, I think what in terms of web design, what, what is really valuable is to, to, to help us rethink um, the organization of data and, and the, the use of data. How many links exactly do you need? On a page, maybe maybe less and less is more, but in some other cases, being thorough is helpful. So I really enjoyed this. Um, we were quite intensively this summer. We met every week, um, and between our meetings, we also had a lot of email exchanges. And Seth came up with a lot of tutorials for us, which is um, which is really you you useful to kind of because a lot of this. I will become rusty two months later. Uh, in the beginning, I may, I may know, but there are so many minute details I'm going, I, I would forget. So all those tutorials are really helpful. Um, I thought I might share one that Seth didn't talk about. So um, this is my personal, this is my research website. This is the digital humanity site that he completely revamped. I loved the, the tiles. Um, <clears throat> to show our latest announcement. I love this um, new feature that he built in. It's basically for the people you have, you have uh, photos. Um, the photos behind this is actually square. So again, this is a plugin to present. And if you click, you can go to various people's website. Um, the project this fall for which Seth is being paid now. So this is beyond the internship paid by my department to revamp our, our blog. And again, as you can see, we use the similar plug in here to what we kind of polished this summer. So this, our departmental blog now comes with these tiles as well as thematic um, tabs. You can click on to go quickly to those different, um, it's a way to organize those, those tiles um, and it allows tagging. So once you tag it, it automatically show up under whichever topic. I'm going to stop here. If you're curious or have questions about the experience, <laughs> happy to answer questions. Yeah, I guess one thing that I'll point out is, so in the spring when we did the call for people who would be interested in doing internships and it, it's just a short Google form that we had um, Seth didn't have any of these skills. Um, he had taken an initial coding course, so he knew a little bit, um, but what he was interested in was developing skills um, that he said would help him in the job market. And so when we had this, when Alexa came to us with the idea of building these websites, it seemed a good match to kind of where he wanted to expand his skills. Um, other people, when they applied, said they wanted to do more data analysis, and we'll hear about some of those projects in the spring as well. But for the skills that he wanted to build out, this was a good opportunity for him to learn everything from how do you set up the web server um, to how do you put sites on it, how do you manage directing websites to where you want them to go, how do you add HTTPS security protocols to your sites, so there's lots of layers of learning. Um, and I think that it was a great opportunity for him to see that and to then build out some sites and learn kind of your way around. Once you get into WordPress, you'll see that it's miles deep. You can do 
all kinds of things within it. Um, and it's just one of the many tools you can use to build websites. It's just very easy and very popular. And it's easy for people to maintain after. So that was one of the reasons it was our choice. Um, unlike something like a Duple or um, some of those other tools out there, it just takes a longer learning curve for people to maintain a site than with WordPress. By the way, um, we also in installed uh, things like a site traffic monitor to allow me to see where people are coming from. It's really useful metadata. Also easy to use, but secure a contact form where people can contact us. And that's also really important. For every functionality, there, there are multiple solutions, like many ways to achieve that. And what I appreciate is Seth was able to research and present me with three options from the most unnecessarily complicated to, to the simplest, but maybe more, lack, more lacking in, in functionality. And then we'll decide which way to go. Um, is it worth the pain in order to set up or maybe it requires payment? It, it, is it worth that, that I buy something? And all of this, I think it's really important independent research scales going forward. Like, like Ryan said, it's miles deep and you will never know enough, but most important is your ability to do the research. And, um, and, and, and Seth not only works for my department now, but also I believe he has, um, he has a part-time job with the Smithsonian. It also involves web maintenance. So, they went out. Questions? Ryan, I was, yep. I wanted to ask you a question about Linode a little bit more because it looks like it's, it, I'm trying to make sure I'm understanding what it is and what it does. Like it's basically like a push button server, like where you can run anything on top of it. And he just chose to use WordPress on top of it. That yeah. Um, so Linode is one of several companies that offer, um, so they offer server space. So it's virtual private servers. Um, so it's not shared server space. So like if you go to a GoDaddy or even Hostinger, they offer shared server space. So basically they have not one, but for example, they would have one server and many people would have a carve out space within that one server. Um, so if it's an Apache server, everyone who's on it is all running on an Apache server. Whereas if you do a virtual private server, you're essentially getting your own server that you can run and manage however you want. So when you buy a Linode space for your five, $10 a month, um, depending on how much traffic and stuff and how much use you're gonna put into it, you're buying essentially a blank server, then you can put Apache on it, you can run it, what they call an engine server, which is like Apache, just another version. You can run pretty much anything you want that's it's your own server. You can run a Python instance on it. You can run R, um, you can set up whatever you want on your server. And they have a lot of things that they pre like will pre-install for you. And that's what he did with the WordPress piece. So instead of having to download the files and put it on your server and then unzip them and run them to get set up, it just does that in the background for you. Um, but yeah, you could essentially run anything you want on your server space, whether it's websites or whether you're um, doing large data pieces. And how it's set up is that you can buy in at a low service. And then if you end up using more, it will move you up and then back down. So for example, I run one website that every now and again, if it's processing a lot of data, it might actually go up and use a bigger package than what I pay for on a monthly basis um, because it only happens every now and again. So it will go up, it might even use, instead of a CPU, it might use a GNU in order to do the processing for a short period of time. Um, so all that capacity is built in. So if you end up doing, let's say you decide to do something with machine learning and it's gonna require um, 
a fair amount of power to run. You can run it and it will just automatically use the appropriate um, type of backend to support what you're doing. So it's a very flexible and useful tool. Um, whereas if you run on something like a GoDaddy, it's good if you're doing a static website that you're not going to do much with, but you're kind of stuck on their platform. You can't update your own software, things like that. And they limit on things you can run because they won't let you use more power than you paid for at the beginning when you set up the server. Sounds like a good solution for the database project and the Indonesian name thing. Mm -hmm, yeah. Like that would work really well for it. So yeah, yeah um, how we can put the Python in. I don't know. Can you say that again? <laughs> Probably in the WordPress. Like, I think in the WordPress theme, we can um, input the Python in. Oh, so yeah, WordPress doesn't play real pretty with Python. Um, <laughs> it, it can work, but what you have to do is you create your own plugin for it, basically. Um, so here, let me share my screen. What might help people too is I'll do, uh, um, I saw when he was navigating through Linode, I saw like, I thought I saw Dask and some other stuff. So I, I think there's a, a way to just use it, something else, like maybe not WordPress or working in Python. Yeah, you can put, um, so I guess also I should say, you can run lots of different things on one server space. Um, so on my Linode, I have five different websites that run off of it for different purposes. Um, one uses the Django, several are WordPress, um, so you can run lots of different things off of one server space. Um, so you can run a Drupal website and a WordPress website off of your one server space. Um, right there. Yeah, so if you're doing a lot with Python, I would use the Django or Flask just because they're all native to Python. That does make it a little bit easier. Um, but that's not to say that you can't get Python to work in WordPress. It just is more challenging than you might think. Um, so since we have a little bit of time. So this is one WordPress site I have. This is pretty much an out of the box WordPress site. So I chose a theme. This is just my personal website. So it has my CV and stuff on it. And I can click here. You can see like my different website projects and they all load. Um, so it's pretty basic. It's easy. This is, um, it's just all pretty much out of the box type of stuff for a WordPress site. But this site is also then very different. So this is one of my, so I have a podcast. This is our podcast website, which looks quite different, but it is also a WordPress site. It uses the tiling um, like Seth used for their site. Um, it brings in a Twitter feed, for example, and uses it as a scrolling mechanism. Um, it has an advanced search mechanism where I can do searches within different categories. Uh, so you could do quite a bit and make WordPress sites look quite different, though they were initially developed for blogging. Um, you don't have to use it as a regular blogging type site, though I'd say 80% of the themes look like blog pages because that's what it was developed for. If you want to do something even more complicated, um, and that was kind of my goal in developing this last site. Um, so this is a website that allows people to actually make recordings through the website. And on the back end, I use Python to edit the recordings together. So basically, I can actually show you. There's a recording tool where you fill out a form and you record five audio clips. Um, 
And then what I do on the back end is using Python is I stitch those audio clips together and then it exports it back out to be its own WordPress page. So like if you go to one of them, it actually exports it out and then as its own page, then you can download clips, you can copy the audio. Um, it does all kinds of things. I was kind of seeing how far I could push WordPress to do things of interest to me. And how a lot of this happens is, so if I go to the back end, so this is the front end where people outside would see it. On the inside then, when I'm managing it, this is what the inside looks like for me. And this is what um, Seth was showing you. There's lots of plugins. So this is the list of plugins that I'm running on this website. Um, so, and you can work with JSON authentication. So you can work with JSON files in this. Um, you can edit the PHP. So WordPress is a PHP based tool. So everything is written on the back end in PHP. Um, and if you go to the theme editor, you can actually go in and edit the PHP files for your theme that you're running. So this is why Seth said it's important to do the child theme, because every time a theme updates, like if they add security protocols or change something, all these files change if, unless you're running them as a child theme. But for example, if you want to see, so this is, like the PHP code that runs the main index page. So there's a wrapper tag, um, has the logo and it brings it in. Um, so all of this you can go in and customize. So you can make it look quite different than the original looked. Um, and as you can guess, this is a highly customized one because that's what I was trying to do. Um, so it's nice with WordPress is that if you want to get into the backend code, you can get into it, you can update it. Um, it will usually, it won't, like if I hit this update file button and my code has errors in it, it will not actually update it. It'll give me an error message. So it'll stop you from messing things up too bad. Um, though I do routinely break my sites. Um, so don't be afraid, you can go back and fix it. And you can always have a backup copies of the files to install. You can also, if you want to get further into customizing your WordPress site and you wanna add JavaScript to it, you can add JavaScripts into the headers and then call them from within. So like on this site, I run a couple of different JavaScripts um, and those just get inserted into the header, just like um, most JavaScripts do. And then you call those from within the body. So they're always in the header of the files. And then you can call them from within the body to do whatever it is that the JavaScript is intended to do. Um, so like this one here, it's a JavaScript to download the MP3 file. Um, if you have one that you like, and yeah, so this is this little script, which amazes me still, this tiny piece of script is what allows for me to like highlight a section of audio and download that clip of audio. So I didn't write the script, I found it and customized it. So it wasn't, I didn't come up with any of this. I just was curious if I could do it and I did it. So in those ways, you can add a whole lot into your um, WordPress. Now, what they don't have though, is anything similar to how I added JavaScript for adding Python. So how I added Python is a longer story um, and it works okay. I would say if I had to do it over again, I would just build the whole site in Python, but that's a lot more work because the nice thing with WordPress is they make everything look really beautiful from the get-go, um, at least in my opinion, it looks beautiful, but they make everything beautiful and easy to do. Uh, 
Yeah, so that's just a couple of examples. I also, I did, this is also a WordPress site. And the cool thing that this one does is it uses RSS feeds to create the content. So I don't actually have to create the content. It uses an RSS feed mechanism to auto-generate content for me, which is useful in some instances. And then it embeds an audio player and does some other fun things with it. So you can do a whole lot with this one tool that Seth kind of really dove into as well and started to figure out how to do some of these fun things. A nice extension on my previous presentation on our markdown site, which is like the simplest version of website ever. <laughs> just plain text, stick it on GitHub, and it makes the site. Uh, it's a different, uh, this is kind of a different world. Yeah, well, I purposes. think that's kind of the, and that's kind of the interesting thing about it is like creating sites quick and fast in R was really great because sometimes that's what you want to do. Like you're working with a group and you want to create a quick website to help people stay informed about what the team is doing in our markdown sites. Perfect. If you want something that's a little fancier looking um, and doesn't require a lot of backends, WordPress is really good for that. It's fairly easy. You can get one set up within a couple of weeks, like have it all customized and looking and doing the things you want to do. But then if you really want to get into something more complicated uh, that has more, for lack of a better word, power behind it, like let's say you want to create a chat bot. Well, then you're probably going to want to use like a Flask or a Django that's native to Python. Um, and then you're getting into a lot more coding parts of it. Um, but that's also the exciting part of it is you can do all of these things with different tools and uh, you don't have to be an expert to do it. You just have to have the ideas and the patience to figure it out. Um, WordPress is pretty huge too now. Like I heard uh, that when Biden took office, the White House website became a WordPress site. Like the, whoever's managing it for them, they they when they like, when they switched over, they're using WordPress. Like pretty important websites are using WordPress uh, on the back end, so most people don't even see it. They don't know it, but it's become quite more than just a blog yeah. uh, platform now. Yeah, and I think a lot of it is, as Seth was pointing out, it's all the different plugins you can get. Um, yeah. Platform now. Yeah, so it has like all types of security plugins you can get to make sure that your site is secure. Um, it does have a database that runs behind it and you can manipulate that database if you choose to. So you can, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. That gets down into a much deeper conversation. Uh, but it has like search engine optimization tools so for example, I use, what is the one I use on this one? I use Yoast SEO, which does search engine optimization. So whenever you put content up, it tells you like, how likely is it that people are gonna be able to find it on Google um, or on Bing or whatever search engine. Um, and it helps you manage your social media tools so it has kind of like all the front end things that you want and as plugins and it has the back end things that you want. Like you want to be able to manipulate your databases to hold different types of data or to pull data from one page to another page in interesting ways. You can do all of that in WordPress. It gets a little messy at times, but it works. I guess the last tool that he mentioned that I should also point out is the Cloudflare, which is really useful tool. Um, so he was just using it for forwarding a site um, to another place. But 
they also offer, so it's just kind of a longer conversation for another day, but if you want HTTPS, so what you have to have is what they call an SSL security um, certificate to get that. Cloudflare offers that for free to your websites. Um, and their primary market actually isn't either of those tools. What their primary market is, um, is they have servers all around the world and they serve your sites from locations. So if you're on Cloudflare and you can see I have lots of sites, uh, this is actually my niece's website. I run her site, um, my son's site and some <laughs> others. Um, but like if someone in Indonesia pulls up one of our sites using Cloudflare, it would pull from servers in Asia, not from servers in North America. So they're always making copies of my sites and putting them on servers around the world so that if someone in that area wants to pull up one of my sites, it can happen very quickly because it's on a server closer to where they are. And that's their primary, I mean, that's what they get paid for. Um, and then they offer all these other services just to make life better for people. So we're more likely to use their service. That's and they really, do all that for free. That's a really helpful feature. Yeah. Um, Especially, um, so most of the world um, is pretty well connected, but with the exception of Australia and New Zealand. In the before days, I had the pleasure of traveling there and internet is actually slower there just because of the sheer distance and the very limited undersea cables connecting those places to major servers. So this ability to actually have your site served up um, in locations closer to those more remote places is really, really important. Yeah. And again, WordPress does a great job with this because most all the themes are also responsive themes, which means that they show up for mobile devices. Um, I won't show you how it works, but you can actually customize it. But you can see like if I go into inspect and I change to a mobile device setup, let me lower this a little. So this is how it looks on a Moto G4 phone. Here, I'll move it to. This is how the site looks on an iPhone X. This is what it looks like on an iPad. Um, so you can choose different. Yeah, you can choose different ways to see what it looks like in mobile versions. Um, and then you can customize it in the CSS, which what is what does the looks and layout of it. Um, you customize the CSS to make it look the way you want it to look on different devices. Um, and again, you do it. WordPress does all this for you. If you build a Django site, you have to build this yourself. But a WordPress would make for the responsive designs and stuff for you automatically. We should, we should put in CSS on the calendar. Probably not this year, but I don't know who's going to do it, but someone just to talk about it because it's a giant wormhole, but also really important. Yeah, it's a good point. It is, <laughs> it is both the giant wormhole and really important. Um, I don't really understand CSS. I use it, but I don't really know what it's doing. All right, well, we're at three minutes, so. Um, I'll hit stop on the recording, but right. that was like a double today of mm -hmm. extra dose of WordPress. <laughs> oh, 